All right, well, good morning. Is this all set? Here we go. All right, well, hopefully you had an opportunity to get a handout. Um, we have those there for you. And then we're going um, slightly out of order just because of um, last week with Ryan not feeling well and some things like that. But it, it will all work out. It just might mess up our acronyms a little, but I, I think we can all... We'll deal with that. It'll all come together as, as we put it together. So Mark and I are twins today. It's kind of fun. So sorry. I just, every time I look up, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so anyhow. All right. Why don't I um, pray and then we'll, we'll dive in to talk about um, studying themes. I, I think this um, hopefully will be encouraging to you and interesting as we go along. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to think about your word, to study your word. We pray that you would help us in the midst of all that we have going on to understand the gift that you've given us in revealing yourself to us through the scriptures. We confess, even as we start, that um, none of us is probably in your word and meditating on it as much as we would like. Um, but we thank you that through Christ we have forgiveness of that, and your posture toward us this morning is one of welcome and giving and delight that we would even come seeking to understand and grow in these things. So encourage us in that and um, help us as we think and speak about these things together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, I think it's helpful just to review the acronyms that we're going through. I know there are a lot of them, um, but the only way we like learn them as helpful tools is just kind of uh, reviewing them. And so the meditation method that we talk about, TPCA, just a way of saying what is the text teaching, what about it could I praise God for, um, are there things that it helps me confess, and then finally, what could I ask God for? Um, and as we've kind of gone through that, thinking about any passage of scripture, I find that it's, it's really been helpful in God-oriented praise and confession, dependence, um, and that's what we're looking for. Any class that's about how to study the Bible, a huge temptation is that it just becomes scholarly knowledge. And not that we're opposed to knowledge. It's not a knowledge-faith dichotomy. It's just a knowledge in and of itself isn't enough, right? We want it to go further. Um, but as we grow in our understanding of things, it helps us in this meditation process. So TPCA is kind of the overarching process we can bring to a text. Then um, specific tools of studying a passage of scripture can be the captor method. And I think of it as, O oh, captor, my captor, which, what is that from? O oh, captain, my captain. What's, is that the, yeah, I know it's captain. Sorry, it is captain, but I switch it to make it Christian. Just kidding. No, it's not at all. But anyhow, the O is for observation. Just remembering that when we come to the text, we try and observe things. And then these tools of looking at the context, analyzing how the sentences and words fit together, which is analysis. Um, Ryan's going to talk about problems next week. We're going to look at themes this week, which is kind of, really, it's a way of saying topical studies of Scripture. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then we'll kind of close out in the next few weeks talking about obligations and then overall like redemptive reflection upon the passage. So these are all tools that help us dive deeper in the what is the passage teaching aspect of things. So this week, let's talk about themes. Um, not all of like what we've been talking about so far is as we're kind of reading through the Bible um, in our personal um, Bible reading how can we better understand the passages that we're coming to? But that's not the only way to study the Bible. Um, that's one aspect of it. But another aspect of studying the Bible is coming to it and asking about a particular theme of Scripture or a topical study of Scripture. And um, I think this is something, as I've talked to believers throughout the years, um, as they kind of find a topic that they're interested in and do a deep dive on that topic— it's really interesting to me how edifying that can be for the person. And then one of the things that I think that's really beautiful about the body of Christ is if each of us has one of those, 
and then we are talking to each other, um, or as Ryan and I are soliciting input about like sermons or passages or things like that, it's really helpful how the body can work together and you're like, oh, I've actually done a deep dive on this particular topic. Here's some good resources I found. Um, I could summarize some of these things. It's, it's a really neat way that the body builds itself up as we all kind of have these areas that we could maybe dive into. So if you're sitting here thinking, why in the world would I ever do a topical study? Part of it is we need you to. It's helpful to the church if you've thought about these things. The other thing is it's just helpful personally. The more I do a deep dive on something, the more it just it gets into you and it enriches your, your own heart. And then you start to see it all throughout Scripture, and it's just an exciting thing. Whereas sometimes the Bible is so big and so vast and so many concepts, we just feel like it's all just floating around. But boy, if you have one or two that you're like, ah, I've got my hands like deep into that, my heart deep into that, it, it can be very rewarding. So um, why would we study a theme or a topic? There are kind of those reasons that I just mentioned that are personally edifying and corporately edifying. But then also, sometimes as we live life, questions come up, right? Um, how, what does God think about money? What does God, th what does the Bible say about immigration? What does the Bible say about um, parenting? What does it say about marriage? What does it say about male-female roles? What does it say about the worship service? Like all these topics, and we could just go on and on. You can, uh, as Christians, I think part of um, our walk with Christ is just thinking through every aspect of our lives. What does biblical wisdom bring to bear on that? Now, we're not going to do a topical study on every aspect of our life, probably, um, but scripture does intersect with all of those things. So sometimes we bring a question to the Bible. Hey, I'm going through this right now. I wonder what scripture has to say. Uh, the other way that themes can kind of come up is sometimes we're reading through the Bible and reading it itself prompts a question, right? You keep coming across Melchizedek and you're like, who in the world is this guy? And so you do a deep dive on Melchizedek or something like that. Or boy, the high priest, it'd be really good to stop and understand what the high priest does or tabernacle structure or whatever it might be. Um, as we're attentively reading scripture, it's good for questions to come up in our heads. That doesn't mean we're not good Christians or since we don't know all the answers, somehow we're failing. That's the gateway into deeper growth. And so um, don't be afraid of those. I wonder what the Bible says about blah, blah, blah. And uh, this will then, today's class will say, okay, when that comes to your mind, where do you go with that pursuit? What are some tools in pursuing that? So let's just walk through um, principles of studying a theme or a topic. I, I think themes and topics could be used kind of just interchangeably here. Um, the first principle is that even if your topic spans the entirety of Scripture, it's generally good, and that's why it's a principle, not an absolute, but it's generally good to begin with a central text. Um, to try and find out, is there a place in the Bible that I'm aware of that talks about this extensively, and to use that then as a starting ground. Um, begin with the central text and then go to other passages. So for the example that we'll use this morning is the example of money. Um, money is something that intersects all of our lives, and it's something that Jesus talked a lot about, Scripture talks a lot about, and we'll talk about it as we go, Sometimes we might not think about enough and just imbibe all kinds of views about it just implicitly from the culture we live in. And so it's good to stop and say, wait a minute, money is a huge part of our lives. What does the Bible have to say about it? So if we were going to study the topic of money, which we'll kind of do in a preliminary way this morning, can you think of any central text that might be good to start with and then branch out from there? Do any come to mind? This is good. So just a disclaimer, um, this, today's class in particular is leaning into like brainstorming all of scripture thoughts. And I know that on a cloudy Sunday morning at 9.15, that part of our brains might be still waking up. So we'll start it with this. If we were going to think of a, a passage about money, where might we go? Any ideas? Yeah, Hank? Yeah, Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 
5 through 7 there. Any other thoughts? Proverbs has some talks about money. Good. Good. Well, Hank got the right answer. But, but yours is right later. No, yours is good. His just has more verses to it. Um, a way, oh, man, sorry, I didn't walk us through. How did you even know what principle I was talking about if I didn't have it up there? Just kidding. Handouts, uh, anyhow. A good, uh, like a great starting place could be, we've heard Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's just take a look at that. And again, just think, let's just clear our minds for a minute and think, I wonder what the Bible says about money. Let's hear what Jesus has to say in this section. Um, Matthew 6, 19 to 24. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So that passage right there gives us a lot to study, doesn't it? And all the things that we've been learning about, context and analysis, and it's part of a discourse that Jesus is giving, all those things can be brought to bear just marinating on this text. Um, we're not going to do all of that this morning. But one thing that I do think is helpful to read, and if you're following along in your Bibles or if you have a different translation, one of the things you might notice is this. In the ESV, um, verse 24 there, you cannot serve God and money. Now, in like the ESV Pew Bible, for example, it's helpful to realize there are letters that are next to words all the time, and those are kind of cross-references. So you'll see like an A, a B, a C, and those relate to other passages dealing with the topic. So we'll talk about those in a minute. But when you see the numbers to the footnotes, those are usually directing you to the bottom where they clarify why they've translated something a certain way. Um, so one thing that the ESV does is it renders everything brothers and then footnotes it brothers and sisters. Um, I think it'd be helpful if it says brothers and sisters, but as long as we understand that's what it's doing, that's okay. Here, they make a translation choice and they um, footnote it saying that that word there, money, is the Greek mammon, a Semitic or Jewish word for money or possessions. So that's interesting, right? They're saying wait a minute, there's this mammon term. And if you're familiar with, I believe the King James does that, right? Can't serve God and mammon. And then they render it money. Huh, that's just something interesting to kind of file away as we think about the topic um, that we could go on as we study things. Principle number one, consider a key text um, and kind of start there. And, and you'll see why as we go on. Principle number two, go beyond the term to the concept. So what that means is this. I wonder what the Bible says about money. Okay, when we look up money in a concordance, um, that's going to give us a set of verses about money. But is that going to give us the entirety of what Scripture says about the concept of money? It's actually leaving out a ton. And you may have noticed in this passage, that's why it's so great to start with a key text, um, this has, you can't serve God and money. It's talking about eye and the body and light and darkness, which I just kind of jot down as like, huh, that would be interesting to dive into. But notice Matthew six nineteen: do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Um, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So that's keying us into this idea that if I'm just thinking about the term money, that's probably not enough. I need to go beyond it to the concept. And so I think you have some circles there in your um, handout. Any of our younger folks, do you know what this is called when you have two circles that overlap each other like that? I saw it. I saw it, Levi. It's a Venn diagram. Does anyone know why? I didn't look up why. You can tell me afterwards. Um, 
anyhow, but it's cool. Overlapping circles, Venn diagram. What you have going on here is the concept of money, which is this left circle, includes the word money. Do you see the overlap there in between? And you could even like shade that in. I, I didn't have the PowerPoint skills to do that this week on my diagram, but you could do it easily with a pen or pencil. But the word money is overlapping with the concept of money. But the concept of money is bigger than that. And so we could think about it further. If you have the concept of money or the theme of money, it includes the word money. There's overlap there. It includes the concept, the word wealth. It would include treasure. It would include possessions. So just stopping and thinking about the concept of money versus just the word money helps us start to think about where to look in Scripture to find this out. Because if you say, I want to understand what the Bible says about money, and you only look up passages that say money, you're not going to have a, a, a full-orbed idea about that, right? Um, that all makes sense. The other thing is, don't just think about the um, words, but also think, are there any parts of scriptural stories that relate to this? We'll come to this a bit in the brainstorming section, but let me just throw out a few things. Um, the Bible shows Abraham refusing to take wealth from a corrupt king. Hmm, that's interesting in Genesis 14. The Bible in James 4 warns people who chase prophets um, in James 4. And then in James 5, it corrects those who defraud the poor in order to live in luxury. So if we're just kind of thinking, what have I heard in Sunday school or sermons about money? Here are some passages maybe to jot down. Um, Revelation 18 condemns Babylon the harlot, right? The epitome of like secular civilization in a sense. What is Babylon condemned for? Several things, but the main thing really listed there is for glorifying herself and living in luxury. Can we just pause for a second and just say we are Western Americans who are like, regardless of, I, I know some of us don't have as much money as, like, I know things can be tight and there are situations that are hard, but like, as we think about our context, it's just really interesting to think about um, some of these concepts. We'll talk about it in just a sec. But Revelation 18 is, is sobering that way. Okay, so you've got a term, money, You've got a concept, money, that includes all more terms. Then, principle three, after we've been thinking about that a little bit, survey the data. So, hey, go far and wide. And then synthesize it. Bring it down into manageable things. Um, so that's just part of a study process. And there's some ways to do that. It's helpful, and I'm going to open this up to you in just a second about brainstorming these things, okay? It's helpful to ask more questions. So we've looked around a little bit. We turn to Matthew 6. Jesus is talking about cancer of God and money, mammon, treasures important. Um, there's this slave-master relationship, like um, being enslaved to one. Are you enslaved to the other? Um, how does that work? But then just kind of stopping and thinking, wait a minute, what, what is the Bible t demonstrating with money? Um, Jesus' pronouncements there in Matthew 6 should raise some questions in our head. Um, in what sense does money rival serving God? Like, what about it rivals that? What, does the Bible say more about that connection? Um, is money just a tool of commerce? When we talk about the dichotomy, you can't serve God and money— then how does that work out? What if someone is a Christian and has a lot of money? What about Christians who say, if you serve God well, you will have a lot of money? So these are all questions of things that are kind of in the air um, that we might want to um, look at. How does the rest of the Bible show us or talk about how money could become a God or a master that we're serving and we shouldn't be serving? Like, what does that look like? And then kind of a bottom line question. Well, with that, how can we, like, what is it about serving money that's problematic? Is there a corrective that scripture offers to how we view our money that undercuts the bad aspect of it? 
And then finally, what does God think of my possessions, my spending habits, my financial goals, my financial dreams? Those are really like practical applications that we're coming to, right? So maybe just jot down questions as you think about the topic. And even as you're studying it, more and more questions will come. Like for me, it's like, what about that whole eye, body, light, darkness thing? Would be something I'd want to look into at some point. Um, but also may not be the most pressing thing in our study of money. So then, after you've asked some questions, it's good to just brainstorm about where you might find teachings about these things. And it's good to brainstorm. So some of us just, like, I love tools, right? Ever since I was a kid, I collected tools, not just to, like, collect them and look at them, but to use them. Um, and I find them very helpful. There are all kinds of tools for Bible study that we'll talk about in just a moment, and we've been talking about as well. But before you go to the tools, it's helpful to brainstorm first. Because one of the things that happens with the tools is as you dive into like a concordance and you look up all the verses about money, all of a sudden you've got 60 verses. to Well, I think it was like 132 verses if you just look up money. Oh no, now I've got 132 ver verses to look up. All the other thoughts go out of your head, right? Like wealth, possessions, treasures, those things I was just asking about before, they're gone because now I've got to study 132 verses about money that most of them say like, and he paid him money. And it's just like, okay, cool. Um, so that's why stopping and brainstorming can be helpful because going to a concordance can be overwhelming and you forget all these other things. So let's brainstorm together. I've been throwing out ideas, so it's okay if you repeat them because it just means you're awake and listening and it reaffirms it makes me feel good. So it's fine to even repeat what I said. What might we examine in our study of money? Someone has the microphone, I think. Thanks, Nevin. So if you've heard, as you've heard all this, all these words I've been saying, what are things you think might be helpful for you as you take a look at it? Yeah, Bruce, just one sec. Wait for the mic, just so... Yeah, can you say that one more time? Just, thanks. Study the disciples' responsibility. Yeah, so studying the disciples' responsibility with money. That's really interesting, right? Jesus says really um, powerful things about money. They have careers and things like that. Do they all leave them? Um, how does that work out? So that's a great thing to explore. Anyone else? Uh, Eamon has something, Evan. <laughs> what, I, what I find helpful, I have a study Bible, and if I'm, um, I go down to the commentary on the main verse that has um, other verses that are linked to that one that will refer to kind of help explain it more and more on the commentary side of things. Yeah, that's great. So you can go to a passage, and especially if you have a study Bible, I mean, those are great, especially when you're trying to look into a topic. And they have all kinds of notes and things that you can then take a look at, jot down. It's good. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Kevin has something. Um, I, th I think about uh, the responsibility of money and also the attitude of being content with what you have. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So we think about money and then, oh, teachings on contentment. That seems to relate. Jot that down because then um, that could be a whole thing to explore. Anything else come to mind just as you're brainstorming? Yeah, Hannah, just one sec. Nevin, we're making you work for it today. Um, I feel like two things that are kind of related. One is the story of the rich man who is told, you know, he's following all the commandments, but he has to give up all his possessions and he chooses not to. Yeah. And then I also think, which kind of relates is the golden calf because they're using their also possessions and riches to worship something other than God. So I feel like they're both very similar. Yeah. No, that's great. So we've got golden calf, parable of the rich young ruler, good things to explore and dive into, right? that are seeming to relate. Anyone else? Isn't this fun? I just think it's kind of fun. <laughs> Mark has something other than the same color. 
Yeah, yeah. If, if Patty, if you can be next, then okay. he's coming all the way up yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, real quick, then, I would I would be thinking about okay, is there anything in the in the creation account in the early Genesis passages that might fit with uh, uh, with that topic? Yeah. So I'd go back to go back to the beginning and see if there's anything there. Right. Yeah, that's great. Anything in the creation account? Nevin, Pat has something up here. And then Umberto, think, because you're far back there. It'll be, this is just fun. Sorry. Again, the use of money, Ananias and Sapphira. You know, oh, how yeah. is money used uh, yeah. for the Lord or not? Ananias and Sapphira, how was money used? There's some lying about money that's going down there. Did Umberto really come up with some? Oh, this is awesome. Oh, Sorry, Nevin, that was, I did not mean to make you go back there. But you're really close. I think Kevin had something again. So. <laughs> We'll, we'll brainstorm about cruelty next. I, um, I think, too, about, uh, about Ecclesiastes and all that oh, Solomon yeah. had to say about the riches that he'd gained and the vanity yeah. that that presented to him. Boy, that's great. I mean, so thinking about Solomon uh, with the Old Testament, even narrative of that, and then what you find in his writings of Ecclesiastes. I mean, if you want to learn about money, how cool to go to someone who had it all and see what he has to say. Um, that's fascinating, right? Anyone else? Okay. Good job, Nevin. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry to make you go over. Oh, man. That's fun. If anyone would like to sign up to be a Mike uh, runner some Sunday, yeah, um, you can talk to Nevin and Caleb about it. They'll, uh, they'll hook you up. Um, let me just boil down just a few things about what we saw in brainstorming, right? Because if, if you come to brainstorming and you haven't had enough coffee and it's just a drizzle, there's no storm, like here are some things that could jog your memory about brainstorming with the Bible. One thing is consider the Old Testament first. Like just stop and think, okay, Old Testament. And so um, some of that was happening, right? Like Mark's saying, we should start with creation. We usually just kind of skip those. We should just see. Um, Hannah brought up the golden calf. Um, Kevin's bringing up Ecclesiastes and then even some narrative about, wait, there was a guy in the Bible who had a lot of money <laughs> named Solomon. Um, so just thinking the category of Old Testament is really interesting, right? Then you can think, and, and you can do this just kind of picturing your Bible. Okay, as we, I mean, do the prophets have anything to say about money? I think they have a lot to say about money. Then we come into the Gospels. Does Jesus have anything to say about money? Does it relate to his disciples and how, what he taught them and what their, how that interacted even with their lived out existence? So Old Testament, Gospels. And then you could think about the epistles or just kind of zoom out and say, are there any direct teachings about money? You know, and this is where, back to what you were saying, Patty, Proverbs has these direct statements about money that we're going to want to pull together. First Timothy 6, warning against the love of money, right? It's like, I heard that somewhere and we, we find where that is. Oh, that's First Timothy 6. You look around First Timothy 6 and you start to see that it's also saying we meet our basic needs, we enjoy God's bounty, we give freely to others, but it's also telling us not to love money, right? And that's all in the context there. So, you know, Old Testament, Gospels, and then maybe direct teachings altogether, those can help make this um, list of things as we're brainstorming. Then you can do, and these things don't need to be totally linear in this step, but this is what Eamon was saying. Use cross-references, right? So as you've brainstormed this list and you start going to any of these passages, like we turn to the golden calf and you find there's cross-references about things like gold or jewelry. Oh, interesting. How does jewelry and adornment relate to wealth? And that gets kind of interesting, right? Because a lot of times we may look at the New Testament passages, which are talking about modesty and adornment, and we key in thinking it's talking about how much skin is showing, and we kind of find in our study it's more talking about how luxurious and what's going on socially is happening there, which happens as we kind of dive into some of that. Um, so all these things can take us in these directions that are really helpful as we think about money and wealth. So cross-references can do that. And then scanning a concordance. And so a concordance, you may have those in the back of your Bible where it has like a topic and then lists all the verses. You can do these online. Does anyone do them online with like something that's free? Concordance? Elise is nodding. Do you know what it's called? 
Blue Letter Bible? Okay, cool. So that, that's, um, you know, a lot of us remember the Strong's Concordance, about this thick, right? We do, and it's all linked to these numbers. All of that's like digital now, and there are lots of free versions. I use Logos, which is a paid thing, but the, it has starter packages that are just so worth it. Um, but there are also free, free versions out there. So Blue Letter Bible. Anyone else know another free way of like looking up all the words in a Bible? Gateway, BibleGateway.com, is that what it is? So Bible Hub. So Google. Oh, nice. So you can go to the Google and figure it out. So that's kind of fun. And then if you're stuck, just ask someone under 30 to help you, and uh, they'll, they'll get you there. That's, that's where I am right now. Hey, Piper, is, is that digital somewhere? Um, so, yes, Dad, it is. All right. There we go. Okay, here's where we get into the dangerous stuff, okay? Um, concordances. Did you know that having a concordance is one of the most dangerous things you could own? Uh, it's really not. That's hyperbole just to keep you listening. But is it working? Why is a concordance dangerous? Okay, um, this principle. Use a concordance. Oh, sorry. Um, so scan a concordance. All of that was kind of surveying, just in case you're like, Craig, you, didn't co you covered survey but not synthesize. Survey is like looking at all that stuff, right? And you're writing it down on a yellow notepad or whatever you like to do. It's a Word doc you have pulled up or something like that. Then synthesizing is just kind of taking all that brainstormy stuff and saying, okay, are there any principles I could boil down right now that kind of work as like a hypothesis? It seems like money can be okay, but there's a way that we worship it that's bad, and I want to better understand that. Just kind of jot that down. Um, there are some stories about money I need to dive into. And so you're just kind of synthesizing it, and then what I like to do is kind of come up with a plan. As you look at all of it, what do we think is most important to look at next? And it isn't even like what's most important. It's kind of, it can be like, what do I want to look up next? Oh, Golden Calf, I love that story. I just want to read about that. Go do it. That's fun. And, but just keep in mind, okay, I want to work through these things to gain an understanding about this topic. So survey and synthesize keeps you from just being overwhelmed. Then number four, use a concordance intensely and selectively. So again, a concordance is a resource that lists all the occurrences of a word in the Bible. So you type in money, and there's over a hundred of them, right? Um, reading intensely means this. When you do look up one of those verses, you consider the context to make sure it's actually relevant to what you're saying. Um, this is where, when, when we say the concordance can be dangerous, this is where it can be because you can go to a verse you can just lift it out of context because it fits your idea about money, and you can extrapolate it to say all kinds of interesting things. Um, so it's important as you go to these passages to read their context. Now, one of the things you may notice is, okay, if you have over 100 references of money, are you going to go do like a full-blown study on every one of those 100? No, part of it is you just skim through it, and you're like, oh, that one's just talking about he paid him money, and it's just moving on in the narrative, right? Oh, interesting to note, but not something to dive into uh, necessarily. So um, read intensely, and then also read selectively. I, I kind of jumped ahead to that point. Um, skim for familiar and informative texts, just kind of grouping stuff together. And then be careful with the concordance. Not only can a paper one light on fire, super dangerous. Um, but also, the, the downside of this is we can really geek out on word studies and really lose sight of what Scripture is actually saying. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you how. Um, here's what um, Doriani says in this, and I think it's a good summary. What we have to keep in mind is the basic units of meaning in language are sentences and paragraphs not individual words. And I've noticed in like biblically literate churches like ours, where we take the Bible seriously, um, it can tend toward word study over emphasis, right? Of I've looked up that word and I see the meanings 
and we just kind of tunnel into that and haven't looked at the sentence and the paragraph. And if that's the case, we can have kind of distorted views of things. And I'll show you that uh, as we go along. Um, what the problem can be is this fun phrase, illegitimate totality transfer, ITT. They should make commercials about it. Like, I, it's just like, to cure your ITT, um, take a concordance and understand this. Okay. Um, illegitimate totality transfer just means this. You're taking the totality of what a word can mean, and you're illegitimately transferring it to the particular verse you're looking at. And so what does that look like? Well, um, let's just use an example that's, that's outside the Bible. Imagine that someone who's studying English to learn English comes upon the word post in a sentence. And they're like, oh, I haven't encountered the word post before. And the sentence is this, the ambassador was reluctant to take up his new post in Albania. The ambassador was reluctant to take up his new post in Albania. So um, we open a dictionary and we look up post and you find that it can be this, a piece of wood or metal fixed in an upright position. A post can be the stem of a pierced earring. I learned that. I uh, forgot it was called a post. Um, a post can also be the place where a soldier is stationed. That makes sense. A post can be an office, duty, or position to which a person is appointed. A post can be a position in a basketball team's offense. A post can be a notice. And a post can be an entry in a blog or website. Okay, so um, if you import all of that into this sentence... So the ambassador was reluctant to take up his piece of wood that was also part of an earring that was an office he was assigned to as he blogged about it that day. That makes no sense, right? Do you see how if we break it down solely to the word, but don't see that the basic unit of meaning is really the sentence that's helping us contextualize that word, um, it can get really wonky. And you could think he was reluctant to... Um, use his earring or something, or write a particular post on Facebook that day. Um, illegitimate totality transfers when you pull it all in um, just because a word can mean that. And, and that's one of the things that can be a downside of just diving too deeply on the words without coming up for air and saying, what does it mean in this sentence and in this paragraph? When Jesus is talking about treasure, it doesn't mean he's always talking about piles of gold and silver and things like that in that like literal way. It can also be non-literal treasure that we may have. And so we have to think about how is the word being used. And so one kind of way to just double check our work, and it, it's not on your sheet, just so you know. So um, you could decide where you want to put it. Some of you might like to put it up in the point that's before. I think it fits right here. It's just when you've done work like this, one of the things that can be helpful is just to, to pause then after that amount of study and read some sort of an article out of like a Bible dictionary or a systematic theology or something like that. Um, it's a great way to just check what else is out there. Um, Bible dictionaries are just amazing because what they do is they'll take terms like this and you have scholars who have studied the word and how it's used, which is what we're doing, they boil it down into an article that's just a few pages, and it often says, like, here's how it was used in the Old Testament. Here's how it was used in the New Testament. Here's its theological use. It's like, oh, that's all so helpful for double-checking and then also saying, oh, that's an area I totally missed and need to understand better. If you're sitting there saying, I don't have a theological dictionary or something like that, um, good. You have more space on your bookshelves at home, which is nice. You could buy those. Um, study Bibles are super helpful with those. But a great place to start is if you just email me or Ryan and say, hey, I'm diving into something. Is there like a dictionary article you could send me? We're able to export a little article about that and send you that, and it's a great place to go. And we have lots of them just digitally stored on our computers. So we're happy to like help with stuff like that as you're diving into further study for yourself. And then as you do that over time, you might say, hey, I wanted to buy ISB for myself because it's a really helpful uh, tool like that. So, okay. 
How's everyone doing? Last point, right? Other than conclusion, which is only 40 minutes, so don't worry, we're almost there. Um, the last point then as you're thinking about a topic and diving into it is also considering the times. Considering the times. And what I mean by that really is, um, is that what I have written in the handout? It is? Okay, good. I went through a few different versions of uh, what this is. But underneath that, I would say this, listen to your culture. Listen to your culture. Um, one of the things that can happen in Christian teaching is that, like, culture is bad, we're opposed to it, and somehow we're outside of it. That's not how the world works. Culture is something that just exists. It's the customs, the language, the, all kind, the water that we swim in as humans is our culture. <laughs> that atmosphere, we all have it. We are all shaped by it. And we're shaped by it in ways we don't even realize. That's part of the, like, it's like fish and water type thing. If you picture culture as the water and we're fish, we're just swimming in it and don't even know that it's there a lot of times. Now, sometimes there are cultural hot buttons that we really notice because these are things that in the culture are being debated hotly and it's tending to make us say, which side of it are you on or things like that. Um, but culture is the language, the customs, the practices, the ways of thinking that are just implicit in living in Southern California in the United States, for example. So listen, instead of being, I'm opposed to culture, because how can you even do that? Like, we're so shaped by it. <laughs> we can't cut off, like, anyhow, our use of language and all those kinds of things. Instead of that, listening to our culture is a really helpful posture for us to just wisely steward the context that we live in. And so as we listen to our culture, um, it can help us decide on topics to study. Um, as we're listening to what's going on in the culture, one of the things that you may notice is there are a lot of questions right now about what identity means. Uh, it's being used in all kinds of ways. We talk about identity politics and gender identities and all kinds of things. Identity, that could be an interesting topic to explore what the Bible has to say about it. Um, sexuality is something that's very um, prominent debated, hot button, people get really mad about it, um, that could be a good topic for us to explore deeply. Like, what does the Bible have to say about that? So considering the times and listening to our culture can help us decide topics that we really need to think through and work through as Christians. So it can help us kind of pick topics to dive into. The other thing that listening to our culture can do is it also helps us be aware of our blind spots and our biases, all right? Our blind spots and biases. These really shape, they can really shape our study of a particular topic, right? Um, right now, and, and this, this has happened throughout, I mean, history, but right now I think we're living in a time that is just over the top in taking issues and making them very polarized, tribalistic, um, taking something and saying, here's a topic, um, sexuality. You're either this, like you're either affirming, or you're a hater. <laughs> you're like, you're either this or that. And there are very few things about in, in scripture or in life that are either this or that in such a black and white way as the, the tribalistic impulses are trying to force us into picking, right? Usually the Bible and the gospel, because of, since God made things and he helps us understand the true reality of things and the nature of the fall and the nature of redemption, usually when we bring all that to bear on a topic, it's way bigger than the two choices we have held before us, right? But one thing that can happen is because all we're hearing are those choices and sides, we, when we come to a topic, may come to it already implicitly asking the question, does the Bible support this side or that side? And God wants to say, I want you to understand it. And a lot of times what you find is things on both sides have aspects of that truth, but maybe going about it in different ways or distorted. Um, 
And so it's just helpful to realize our biases as we come to the text. Um, we've been talking about this a little bit in our sermon series, like with Romans, how much we can come. I mean, we're, we're diving into Romans 9 now, right? Um, and one of the things that's historically happened with Romans 9 so much is because it talks about election and things like that, we come to it to answer our questions about election and we lose sight of like, why does Paul even bring this stuff up here? And what is Paul actually trying to tell us about how this works? And instead we come with, um, and, and so this is where our culture of being conservative, reformed, baptistic types may shape it, right? How do I blast my Arminian friends from Romans 9? And we come to it already asking that, right? Or I don't really like election. I want to look at it and see why it's not true. Like all those things would distort our understanding of what's going on there. And those can be implicit blind spots and biases that we might have, which is why it's important as believers to be students of our culture, listening to it and, and seeing what may go on. Okay, I say all that to bring us also to back to the topic of money. Because what's, I think, very interesting is if we listen to our culture and our implicit biases about money, what do you think they are? What do you think is in, and I'll, I'm asking rhetorically, I guess, because I want you to think about it, but I won't make Nevin run around with a microphone. But if you think of what do Southern Californian Christians what are their implicit biases about money as they come to topics in Scripture? What do you think they are? Um, I can speak for myself. They are very much, I'll listen to that, but it doesn't apply real well in my situation because we live in America. <laughs> and because I find myself in this particular class of earning or capital or whatever. And I find a bias that I can have is when I hear Jesus' teachings about worshiping money, it's like, whoop, on to the next thing. Like, yeah, that's a problem. Don't, um, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Hmm. Have I like hugged my money lately? No, probably okay. You know, it's all digital anyway, so it's hard to like find a stack of cash. Um, if anyone doesn't like hate his own life and leave his possessions and family and things like that for the sake of following Christ, um, he's not really my disciple. Uh, okay, next. <laughs> like just not letting those things sink in, um, I think is an implicit biased and blind spot that a lot of us probably bring to the table when we come to Jesus' teachings about money. It's also interesting that what are words in our culture for, for money-type things? Um, Jesus talks about in Matthew 6, if we dove into that more, you can't serve both God and money. Serving is interesting, right? Um, bowing before another, taking orders from another. If we were to do a deep dive on money, and then that footnote that we saw that's mammon, as another term for money that's only used four times. If we were to open that in a Bible dictionary, um, what it would tell you is, okay, the exact origin of this is a little bit debated, but it's coming from Aramaic, and what it seems like it's connected to is the word for amen, basically, which is a word for what we say at the end of something that verifies it's trustworthy, right? So following me, amen, we're like, that's a trustworthy statement, amen to that right? That's kind of, that's how, that's where that's coming from. Mammon is this play on amen a little bit that was also used to speak of wealth in various ways. And it's possible what Jesus is doing there when he chooses not to say money, which is just a normal word for money, and instead says this word mammon, which is a little less used and sounds like amen. I mean, we're, we're crossing language things, so it gets a little tricky, but you're following me. Is he referring especially to the aspect that we have a tendency to trust money? That money becomes our amen in so many ways. It's a trustworthy source for us. Um, and 
does that all relate to Jesus' teaching about serving God and money? Are we trusting in money for the things that only God can give? That becomes a, a heart measure that we would find as we're studying out that passage, right? What do you think the culture we live in says about trusting money? <laughs> yeah, you better trust it. <laughs> like, it's the only trustworthy thing. Um, what is a word for the financial assets that we have? Securities. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Just kind of examining the language that we use. What have you set up for your um, relatives? A trust fund. <laughs> Again, these things aren't bad, right? And you can call something a security or a trust fund. Like, it's not like, let's boycott the word. It's not the word that's the problem. It's the heart that's the problem, right? And so as we just stop and consider the times, and as we zoom out and just examine the water, the air that we swim in, right? It says, wait a minute. Everything in our culture says it is fine to trust money. Um, I was reading a little bit about it, and um, one sentence that I came across was, like, we, money in our society is a demigod. It is a god that we trust in, and it's totally accepted. And the tricky thing about money is it's a polytheistic god. Money is fine with you worshiping other things, but it's going to be one of the gods that you worship. And so that's why it's so subtle for us, right? Because we can be worshiping it, and it's not co contradicting going to church or taking a stand for Jesus or being pro-life. It's not contradicting those things, but it's vying for a place of worship and trust that Jesus says is incompatible with the trust that we need to have in God and his provision. And that, that makes us step back a little bit, right, and consider our hearts in the process. And so that's why, you know, as we do this study, it's always also bouncing back and saying, consider the times, consider our culture, consider my own heart within the culture. How does this genuinely speak to the times I find myself and where my heart really is? Um, so that's a helpful thing that way. As we close, you know, this was just high level, but remember TPCA? What does the passage teach? Well, worshiping, trusting in money uh, in a way that competes with God is problematic. Like we could just kind of stop there. There's all kinds of other stuff it teaches about like stewardship and we didn't dive into all that, right? Okay, TP, what can I praise God for as we think about that? He's the one who owns a th the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He's the one who has all the wealth and resources we need, not only materially, but in our very souls. Life with God is the completely satisfied, blessed life. Um, and that's a praiseworthy thing about God. Um, and it brings us to him in praise for just the wonder of who he is and how he's the thing that can truly, he's the one who can truly satisfy us. What does that lead us to confess? I spend my day worrying about, is there enough in my bank account that I I'm trust, like trust can be taken off the table for the day? Or is it like, uh-oh, um, things are dicey because it's not where I want it to be. So that can be a thing. Um, so we could be confessing things like that. We could be confessing how we worship and trust the things that money buys, which as you study scripture, that's, that's where the concept's bigger, right? It's not just the money in the bank account. It's the stuff that money gets that becomes what we trust in and look to other than God, right? So we can confess those things. And then what do we ask? Wow, in light of your word and in light of the culture in which I live, this is a really dangerous thing. God, will you keep me from the love of money? Will you help me to trust you more for my daily bread? Will you, you know, as we go through those things, that posture of humble dependence in light of what the Bible is showing us as we study it uh, is that helpful meditative way of looking at scriptures. So you can read with an eye toward themes, which just means as you're reading through the Bible and noticing something comes up, you can jot it down and as you have time, take a look at that. Here's just a summary as we close. 
The tools for thematic study include cross-references, so those are the other passages that refer to the same things, concordances, which tell you all the uses of a word, Bible encyclopedias and dictionaries and theologies, which that's why I mentioned like you could reach out to me or Ryan and we could point you in the direction of some helpful ones without over, overwhelming. I mean, you could spend your whole life reading those, but one or two would suffice. Um, but we don't generate good thematic studies merely by scrutinizing keywords or by consulting sources. We must know the scriptures, know people, know the times, and take a few risks to bring them together creatively. Um, really risking opening up our own hearts to hear what the scriptures really has to say about us and um, how we live wisely in this world, right? And so I, th I thought that was a helpful summary. So I just wanna encourage you all, um, that may all be overwhelming. Here's kind of the bottom line takeaway. Is there something in life that you're like, I wonder what it would mean to live wisely as a Christian in relation to this. Um, any topic that comes to mind on that, maybe jot that down somewhere and make it a goal to just chip away at studying that. And you could pull out this handout and you could walk through some of the steps. If you get stuck, reach out to me or to Ryan. We'd be happy to throw things your way. And as you do, it not only helps you live more wisely and more deeply appreciate God's word, but it's also a blessing to the body as we're all doing that together because we can encourage each other with what we're learning and growing into. So it's something all of us can take a stab at and do, and it will be edifying for all of us, young, old, men, women, everyone in the church. That's the beauty of God's word. Let me uh, pray as we close. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It definitely is convicting and cuts us to the heart. We confess our love and trust in money and things in so many ways. We confess our um, deafness often to scriptures cry about these things. We confess how much living in luxury seems like something we can aim for and is acceptable when your word tells us uh, we should be checking our hearts as we think those things. So we just pray that you'd continue to help us as a people, uh, as your church, to think better about money even from these few moments today and um, to overflow in generosity toward those who are in need. And we pray that you would help us to trust in you and to continue to find you more and more trustworthy as we do. Um, we also ask your help as we go to the worship service to um, sing your praises, to pray your word, and also to hear your word as it's preached. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.